Hello, yo. Yes, this is a PS. This is a PS. I heard you very well. Just imagine two guys going seven miles down into the deepest end of the deepest ocean. USS Winding, we have bioluminescence at 32. USA, get you know, over. Just boggles your mind to think of something going down there. A dive to the deepest known place on Earth. Challenger Deep in the Pacific's Mariana Trench, more than 11 kilometers beneath the sea. No air, no light. Two men would set out to explore the ocean's most hostile extremity. 28-year-old U.S. Naval Lieutenant Don Walsh, a qualified submarine officer, and 37-year-old Swiss engineer Jacques Picard. Together they would pilot a one-of-a-kind bathyscaphe, the Trieste. A creation of Jacques' father and collaborator, physicist Auguste Picard, best known for his high-altitude study of cosmic rays. Through the 1920s and 30s, his pressurized spherical capsule would set records, surpassing an altitude of 21,000 meters. Auguste Picard was unbelievable. He never took a rest. Even on the coffee break, he was thinking about something. Always working. Between 1930 and 1932, his balloon flights produced the first accurate measurements of radiation from space. Picard traveled to the 1933 World Exposition in Chicago, where his stratospheric gondola was on display next to the deep diving bathysphere designed by Otis Bowden and William Beebe. The experience was life-changing. Picard would now direct his attention to deep sea exploration and research. Delayed by the outbreak of World War II, it was not until 1948 that the craft would finally venture into the ocean. On its first unmanned deep dive, Picard's FNRS-2 would reach the astonishing depth of 1,400 meters. Picard knew that it could withstand pressure at depths far, far greater. His third and most ambitious attempt, a new bathyscaphe, the Trieste. The principle behind the, the design of the Trieste is it's a balloon. It's a balloon that goes down instead of up. Hanging below this gasoline-filled bag, if you will, the steel ball where these two guys were crouched together looking out this tiny, tiny little porthole. When you think about the basic physics, you know, gasoline floats, you just need enough to float that 11-ton sphere. Uh, you got the chambers on the end for air that hold you up in the surface like a life jacket amazing stuff that they really pulled off. The U.S. Navy Office of Naval Research had heard of Picard's work in Italy, by now in collaboration with his son Jacques. Uh, undersea warfare is the Navy's game, and that's a part of it that I was involved in. And you need information. I think it was in 1956 or so, I got a directive to visit Naples, Italy, and inspect the bathyscaphe Trieste. There were a lot of things we didn't know about the atmospheric environment. Trieste offered a possibility of getting information that otherwise we couldn't get. The Navy, they were operating in a world that no one really understood, and they needed to study this and understand it, so they went to Europe and they found the Trieste. It was a very interesting visit. The team was comprised of Jacques Picard, an Italian mechanic, Giuseppe Buono, I grew up in the shipyard in Italy, and Project Trieste came along, and that was right in. And a 12-year-old boy named Johnny, that was the entire team. So came back and reported on that and said, yeah, it looks like it's worth looking into. In 1958, the Navy purchased the Trieste, replacement parts, and the consulting services of the Picards and Giuseppe Buono for $1 million, moving them all to the Naval Electronics Laboratory in San Diego. A gutsy deep-sea research mission had begun, Project Necton. Qualified naval submarine officer Lieutenant Larry Schumacher was appointed executive officer, and 34-year-old Dr. Andy Rechnitzer was appointed scientist in charge and project director. Andy was a pioneer in his own right, 
who helped convince the Navy to <laughs> do what they did. Just one of those people who truly made a difference. I was a lieutenant in the Navy, 28 years old, and four years out of the Naval Academy. So one day, I'm sitting in my office on board the submarine tender, then comes this fellow, introduce himself. My name's Andy Recknitzer. And he said, the Navy's just bought this new thing, Bathyscaphe Trieste. And he had this very, very tall guy with him. He didn't say much. His name was Jacques Picard. The Commodore said, well, how can we help? Andy Recknitzer was loaded for that question. He said, glad you ask. The only job description in the Navy we can find that is for a submersible pilot would be a submarine officer, one volunteer. And I became the officer in charge of the U.S. Navy Bathyscaphe Trieste, my first command in the Navy. Recknitzer and Schumacher quickly assembled a small team of naval and civilian specialists, no more than 17 men in all, with a taste for the unknown. In 1959, they put a flyer out to the fleet and asked for a submarine engine, and he found out they don't make things, submarine engines. So they put out a notice that we wanted machine repairmen. And I was a brand new machine repairman chief at that time. The goal of Project Necton was basically to prove out this new platform, to show that it was capable of going anywhere in the world ocean. How do you do that? You go to the very deepest place in the ocean. Oh, I would like to go all the way someday. How, how far is all the way? 35,150 feet. And the bathyscaphe, take somebody down that far, Jacques. Let's just get going, you guys. In 1959, after just a handful of dives off the coast of California, Recknitzer felt the Trieste was ready for deeper water. They found what they were looking for in the Western Pacific. Necton's mission, a dive to the deepest place on Earth, Challenger Deep. 350 kilometers southwest of Guam, 10,960 meters below the ocean's surface. Here, Mount Everest would stand 2,066 meters underwater. The Marianas Trench it's as far away as you can get on the planet from the surface of the planet. Performance of every system on the Trieste was rigorously evaluated and adjusted. The Trieste, as purchased and delivered in San Diego, was a 20,000-foot submersible. At the original cabin, which was made in Italy, and the original floater balloon was only capable of that depth. The real star was John Michel. He was the kind of guy that, if you had a requirement for somebody, just tell him what you needed, give him the materials, you know, sort of shove them under the door, and out would come the perfect piece. He needed so many, many things done on the scaff. As I started replacing things, broke the antechamber window, the sphere came apart, the water current meter, that wasn't working anymore. He took the Trieste in and put it up on land and took it all apart, and then put the new cabin on it and had the extended balloon. Everything on the bathyscaphe is one of a kind. Nothing you can buy off the shelf. Everything that we put on the bathyscaphe, we had to think of and design and make it. Test dives off Guam began. Nothing could be left to chance. They did this step by step by step. Each time they did it, there was this kind of challenge and response and challenge. And so they worked deeper, they got deeper. November 59, we made a dive to 18,000 some odd feet. So that set a new world's record. And then in January, we dove to 24,000 feet, another record. The team faced daunting setbacks, but each was met with a solution. Confident, the fragile Trieste was slowly towed towards her destiny. If you're interested in where the deepest spot is, you've got all kinds of maps. But that's a very long time ago and probably not too accurate. So what we did was we used explosives. And we'll time the echo. We surveyed an awful lot of water out there trying to find that deepest spot. And on the day before the deep dive, we had it pretty well nailed down where we wanted to be. After months of work, the day had come. January 23rd, 1960. With Lieutenant Don Walsh and Jacques Picard selected to make the attempt. On the morning of the deep dive, we had now determined where Challenger Deep was, sort of this axis of seven miles long and about a mile wide. And when the tug came out from Guam, towing the Trieste at a magnificent five knots, which is as fast as we dare go, 
Because remember, it's an underwater balloon. It's pretty fragile. And came out, we said, okay, put it here. That's where we did the dive. There was a lot to think about that morning. The sea state was somewhat rough. Well, that day was pretty bad. <laughs> we ended up on the rough sea, and the Trieste was pretty bad. The inside was more safe than the inside because of the waves. It was a lot of shock there. They got to decide we could do or we can do. The moment comes, if you miss it, it may never happen. You can do all the preliminary work and all the rehearsals, but when you make that final push to the very bottom of the ocean, boy, this is for keeps. And that was a big to-do. We had a meeting at our long green table. We had two lieutenants, myself, Picard, and Andy Recknitzer. Picard said, I don't believe we should make the dive. Andy Recknitzer says, why not? I never forgot in my life. It was 2 o'clock in the morning, Picard was sitting on my bed, I said, what do you think? She said, make the dive or not? Well, he says, I'm not sure. It's not perfect. You know, things are not perfect. See, the problem was to get out of the rubber boat to go on top of the trees with the waves. It was uh, too dangerous. And Don Walsh said, sure, we can make the dive. You know, we can do this sort of thing. Picard says, hmm. And he wasn't really sure. Don Walsh come up and said, well, John, he said, you put the sphere back together. Would you make the dive? I said, hell yes. So I told him, I said, if you could get on board, you got him. Then it's good. He said, then we'll make the dive. Jacques and I went aboard the Trieste as quickly as we could. Our feeling was the longer we stayed out there, just out of line too in these waves, we might have something break off that wouldn't let us make the dive. Better to get on with it. And people say, were you scared? No. Uh, we've been doing it for several months. Uh, it's, I suppose, like test flying an airplane. You're on your game, that's for sure, and the adrenaline's way up there, but that's a little different from being scared. We're just very alert to everything, every noise, every nuance. But we'd heard all of those noises and nuances already, so we were pretty much at one, if, if you will, with the machine. We got down the cabin and off we went. wondered what it was like for these guys to make this descent just outside the wall of this crew cabin. There's no oxygen to breathe. It's forever dark, and the temperatures are near freezing. It's tense. Inside the cabin, probably around 40 degrees, and it's almost like a household refrigerator, and not much uh, bigger than a household refrigerator. It was close in there. They have totally different backgrounds. One was an American naval officer, Don Walsh, and Jacques Picard was a Swiss engineer. I tried to imagine him sharing this tiny little sphere, Picard being so Swiss and so courtly and sort of aristocratic, if you will. And Don, he was so Navy, <laughs> used to getting his own way. I mean, after all, he was in charge. If they had differences on the surface of the ocean, those differences disappeared as soon as they got below the surface. This was a kind of combat with the forces of the ocean. And combat like this really brings people together. They were tight inside that sphere. He came from a different place, a different world, a different set of values, but we had a common goal. Hello, yes, this is the Trieste. We are descending very slowly. The Trieste began her descent to the bottom of the ocean. 100, 300, 1,000 meters, deeper, deeper. Releasing small amounts of the aviation fuel ballast, Walsh and Picard guided the Trieste to the thermal layers of the ocean, adjusting their rate of descent one to two meters per second. At 1,000 meters, they had slipped beneath the reach of the sun into the midnight zone. 4,000 meters, the abyssal zone, home to the most bizarre creatures on Earth, surviving under pressures of 9,000 pounds per square inch. As they descend, they will be seeing these flashing lights, these luminous shapes, these forms that are moving upward 
as the vehicle descends. With the lights out and looking outside, you can see all these bioluminescent creatures in the ocean. It looks like, you know, snow coming up like this. And they hear the pressure pushing on the crew cabin. The gasoline is cooling, so it's getting smaller. It's also being compressed. There was a variety of noises of, of metal being working. This thing is groaning in a special kind of way. 6,000 meters, the hadal-pelagic zone. Water temperature freezing. Inside the sphere, a chilling four and a half degrees Celsius. 9,000 meters, as deep as a commercial airliner flies high. The pressure on every square inch, almost 16,000 pounds. That's twice the weight of two armor Humvees. It's pressing on every square inch of steel. The total weight on the crew cap is the full weight of the Pacific Ocean. A gut-wrenching sound hammers the Trieste. Both men react, searching for answers, for leaks, anything that would explain what was happening. At about 31,000 feet, we had a great big bang, and uh, we really didn't know what it was, except that we were still alive. The big fear was that water was going to come into that uh, crew cabin and turn these guys into pink hash, because that's what the ocean does at those pressures. The thing is, if it had been a failure of pressure boundary, the pressure there was about seven tons per square inch. It had been over instantly. They waited for the end and didn't come. But they were so close to the bottom, and since they weren't dead, and they decided to keep going. We looked at all our gauges, everything was working well. So we uh, continued the dive. I mean, who else would do that except these two guys? That was the heroic moment. The Trieste passes 10,500 meters. Steel shot ballast is released to slow the descent. External mercury vapor lamps beam out into crystal clear water. Finally, after five and a half hours of free descent, the Trieste settles on the bottom of Challenger Deep. We shook hands and we're kind of pleased that uh, we had done something. I think it was a feeling of exuberance, a calm feeling of, well, we did it. Life magazine had a small camera fixed inside the cabin. So we triggered that and took a picture of the two of us sitting there. It's the analog to Hillary and Tenzing Norgay on top of Mount Everest. The two guys up there got a picture taken. We, two guys down there, we got our picture taken. Sediment rises from the sea floor. Billions of tiny organisms undisturbed for thousands of years. The cloud came up as we landed. It was like being a bowl of milk. But just before we landed at the bottom, we did make a rather exciting find. We saw a flatfish, maybe a foot long. What's in the water? You certainly far from the silent world out there. This dive was made with a big question mark. Is there any sign of life on the bottom of the ocean? That's quite a finding. No one really thought that you'd find a high order marine vertebrate in the deepest part of the ocean. That was a breakthrough in biology. Their mission accomplished. It was time to return. Shall we go up? Do we have to? It's time, we have to go now, you know? Uh, okay. We have to go now. The first part of the journey is over, but then they've got to get back up that seven miles. And to do that, they've got to release the ballast. There is the risk that that ballast can't be released for some reason. It won't come out of the hoppers. We are not moving up yet. No? Are you sure? I'm sure. It was the second seven miles, the most difficult. But once they started to pick off the bottom, they kind of knew that they were on their way home. Yes, now we're off and away. Yeah, I can't see the bottom anymore. No, we're already drifting. Three and a half hours later, Walsh and Picard resurfaced, opened the hatch, and stepped out into the rose-colored Pacific sun. I think this is the real milestone for the Navy and for France and of course for the Picard family. But as it happened, there was another passenger on board. Well, Jacques had a specially made uh, 
Rolex did it, watch that he put inside the sail down underneath. They want to know if they got to stay under that kind of pressure. So I put them in the chamber, I lock them up, secure everything, and the watch went down with the trees. When they come back, it was running. And from then on, in Life Magazine or wherever, you saw the deep diving watch that they made that went on the Trieste. Word of the deep dive spread quickly. A record that would never be broken. Walsh, Picard, Recknitzer, and Schumacher would receive commendations from the U.S. Navy. As for the Trieste, her name would proudly carry on the traditions of deep sea endeavor. Don and Jacques have taught us something about courage and about commitment and about overcoming obstacles to get something really important done and get it done well. These guys are heroes. These guys were incredible. To take the calculated risks that they did, they're amazing guys. They really opened up an entire new dimension of the world. Our business was not about setting records. It just it was incidental to testing out this new scientific platform. The ocean, you know, 70 percent of the Earth's surface, and there's so much of it has never been explored. And every time someone goes out, they're finding something new that can be helpful to humanity. It's astonishing that no one has been back since that first magnificent expedition on the 23rd of January, 1960. Why not? People can wish to go to the moon, and some have made it. But only two people have ever been to the deepest part of the ocean. They were the first. They should not. They should not be the last.